Well, we're going to start it again tonight, folks. Sorry to show you all this mess. I saw the latest film, Heretic, with Hugh Grant. And before I give Dave Hill a chance, you know, I want to break into my Dr. Pepper and uh, take a bite of my hamburger here. I'm also working on the editing of the project, by the way, so I hope that doesn't cut in audio-wise. But uh, I wanted to really kind of, you know, introduce this film because I thought it was actually rather good. And, uh, you know, it's it was fun. It wasn't over the top. It's it's got a good performance by Hugh Grant. Hugh Grant, that's for sure. Hugh Grant. Hugh Grant. You may know him from um, recently. He was in Dungeons and Dragons, uh, alongside Chris Chris Pines. You know from the Star Trek movies. Funny movie. I saw it like four times. Um, also, he I think he was in like something uh, some holiday love movie. We also have. Uh, some, we have one breakout star, and another star that kind of broke out, like, last year, roughly a year ago, but it's still kind of breaking out, and just let me get into IMDB page here, I know this may be kind of a copyright going on, but I wanted to really start, you know, listening to other people, well, not start listening to them. I wanted to give my own little review first. I think that... And also, we're going to go into... Like, For a time. And hope... Lore, you know. Um, the movie, I thought, was great, you know. Uh, we're going to start... I was going to start with Dave, but I think I'm going to start with Jeremy. You know? Um, or maybe I should just start with Dave. Kind of make it feel. <clears throat> anyway, uh... So, here's Heretic. And... Maybe this is kind of the divide. I don't want to open up too many tabs. It stars Hugh Grant as Mr. Reed, like Reed Richards. Sophie Thatcher, that's the woman that's kind of already been doing it for a year. She's been out for a year. Maybe more than that, like a year and a half. Sister Bones is her character. Alongside Chloe East. This is the new breakout actress that I wanted to mention. She plays the character Sister Paxton. Now, Chloe East, I've never seen her face before. I've definitely seen Sophia Thatcher. She was recently in um, Maxine, you know, another movie by A24. And this movie is produced, I believe, by A24. So, A24 is just pumping out these horror movies like fucking crazy, man. It's just, it's brilliant, but, you know, it's like they always do. They, they do other projects, but... So, uh, of course, we got... I didn't know. I, didn't, I did not expect this. We got Topher Grace along, that plays Elder Kennedy. Um, Topher Grace is scheduled another release. <clears throat> I just restarted this computer kind of, so it's gonna. And this is the trailer. Hope for you like flying. Sorry, didn't mean to play that. That movie is called Flight Risk, alongside uh, Mark Wahlberg. Not really sure that's gonna come out. <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and look at that real quick. I think it's released, scheduled for released about. Well, that that's not really. I mean, well, look at oh, January of next year. So there you go. Uh, <coughs> so Chloe East, <coughs> okay, Kelto is you know she goes into, I think, when she's kind of like I think she's nearsighted, no farsighted. She's definitely farsighted because she needs glasses to read. Uh, anyway, these two, Sister Paxton and Sister, Sister Barnes, basically they are two members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you know, the Book of Mormon, and that's the one that's, you know, considered the cult. It's not really as trust trustworthy as um <coughs> Christianity. Christianity, the Bible has warned against books like that. Personally, I'm not a part of it. I'm not a part. I don't really go by the Book of Mormon. I, I, I actually was kind of persuaded to, but I consulted my counselor in high school, and because I they, they they lead you to they actually lead you, lead you to believe that Michael the Archangel is the same person as Jesus Christ, and that when he became Jesus, he was basically 
God's son in human form. Like he was basically an angel, and then God chose that angel and, and turned him into his son, and then sacrificed himself, and then he's going to come back, the leader of the angels. And that only makes sense for Michael and Jesus to be the same. And I actually believe that for like, I think about a few weeks, and I consulted my counsel. I, 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 get, I think she, she wasn't really academic counsel, but it was in high school, and she said she was a Christian. She told me from this is before the world went woke, by the way, this was back in 2000. Nine-ish, so before the world went woke, so it wasn't a big deal. The teacher wasn't trying to like persuade me religion-wise, um, and even and even if she, and, you know, even though it might be seen as that, I didn't really care. I know nowadays they can't really do that, you know, kind of because of the legal, you know, facts on discrimination and shit and stuff like that. But she did, you know, we convinced me that Jesus and Michael the Archangel are two different people. T I'm sorry, two different entities, not people. Well, you know, Jesus is supposed to be, but two different entities. Anyway, so the story is um, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. It starts out with the two sisters trying to see if anybody wants to uh, know about the story of you know Jesus Christ the Savior and you know start talking about the Book of Mormon and all that. It later goes on to about who established the Book of Mormon, that Joseph whatever guy. Um, but you know they're talking to. They eventually meet Hugh Grant. There's this good scene where they go up these hills with their bikes and they talk to a few people that, and ask them if they want to talk about the church. And you know they just ignore them. Then they go back down that same hill, like literally five seconds late. Like well, yeah, five six later they go back down that same hill. Might be seven seconds. But anyway, they gotta walk back down that same hill down the steps. Makes me wonder. I was wondering why they didn't just ride their bikes down the hill. I know they wouldn't wind it up, but down the hill. You know. Anyway. So they probably didn't make him dolly, but anyway, I'm, I'm getting I'm getting off point. They eventually make their way to Mr. Weed, once again played by Hugh Grant, who I happen to have right beside me. I am messing around. That is a lie. I apologize. Forgive me, Lord Jesus. I know I'm just messing around. Anyway, um, so Hugh Grant, he starts off as a charming individual that is interested in learning about the Church of Latter-day Saints. And... He says he's already got a copy of the book, but he, you know, one more couldn't hold. He sits down with them, says that he's going to make cherry, said that his, he says that his wife is making cherry pie. And basically because Sister Barnes and Sister Paxson are women, they need another women, woman, woman to be present in the house before they can be allowed in. So they ask Mr. Weed if he, if, if he has like any type of female in the house, you know, whether it be a, you know, a sister, a girlfriend, a roommate, a wife, and he says, well, his wife is, his wife's home, does that count, he asks, and she said, perfect, they're like, perfect, so they go in, you know, and I guess that's just the rules of the group, you know, for safety purposes, there has to be another woman in the house, because there's been issues with, uh, two, one, uh, one or more women inside the house of a male, of a solo, of a solo male, and then that male would later assault them sexually, or, and or worse, and, of course, I'll get into that a little bit later, that does happen, but, anyway, so that's why, that's why they need another woman in the house to be present, in which Mr. Weed, he says, he lies, and says that the, his wife is there, but we find out that his wife is not there, um, we don't even know if he's actually been married, there is no history to Mr. Weed as to why he does what he does, he is a, a psychopath, because he's manipulative, so according to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, he is manip manipulative, charming, so he's by definition, clinical definition, a psychopath, um, Unlike Michael Myers, who cannot be compared because he's just a strip sociopath, doesn't kill. Anyway, he manipulates these two girls into believing that, you know, he's heard the story before, and it goes into this, like, the, the uh, you know, theory and hypothesis of what religion are, disbelief versus belief, belief and disbelief, um, how does one navigate their life with that, and he later on reveals that he doesn't believe that any of the religions exist, he thinks that they're all simply copies of other older religions, like religions were simply copied down throughout humanity as a way to control people. And this can, I guess, go into kind of like the video game Assassin's Creed when the whole Apple of, Apple of Eden with the whole control aspect, but that's besides the point, I digress. Uh, what I'm saying is, is that basically he believes that control is the true religion, and, and it does make sense as, as to how some people believe that control is a, uh, type of religion, because it is used to manipulate people, the same way he manipulates the two women into first believing that he is taking their, uh, <clears throat> 
taken the well, taken the thing seriously, taken the uh, <clears throat> going to the going to his house seriously, the visit seriously. I'm sorry, I know I'm uh, kind of off right now. I'm also trying to get this editing project out of the way before 11:59 p.m. So forgive me for that. Anyway, um, so. He has a trap set up in the, in the basement. There was two doors leading to his basement. He labels one belief and one disbelief, and he says, "In order to he says, if you want, if you want to escape, if you want to leave my home, you have to you have to go to the back of my house." Due to the simple fact that for some reason his front door deadbolt is on a timer, which means that it won't, it would not unlock until the following morning. And there literally is a timer, by the way. He's got it set up in like this little underneath the light switch. He has this weird little. I don't know if it's weird, but, you know, little timer thing that he mani- manipulates when Elder, Elder, um, Kennedy later appears to see where the women are, to check up on them. Um, yeah, Topher Grace, Topher, Topher Grace did not get a lot of screen time. He was basically, uh, supporting actor, but, you know. Anyway, the st- stars, of course, two Grant, Sophie Thatcher, and Chloe East, who give a mar- marvelous performance. I won't go into spoilers. I kind of did, but I don't want to go into spoilers. Anyway, the two so for the two sisters Paxton and Barnes have to figure out how to escape his house because they end up inside of a basement, and the dude lives on a hill. So basically, they would have to get out of the basement and end up down the hill somehow. It's kind of like his house is on the edge of a cliff, is how he says it. So the back of the house would end up on the cliff. So even if they did get out, it's kind of like I don't know. Would would you be hanging on the cliff or something? Would kind of be climbing way down, parkour style, whatever. Anyway, um, yeah. So the two of them don't we? Well, I don't want to get into spoilers, but it's not really scary. It's a little through the wild, I guess. A little spooky, but not too scary. It's not really a horror movie so much as it is a, it's a psychological horror, if you will. Definitely a psychological horror. Def, definitely different. Definitely different, I say. Um, Hugh Grant, once again, is brilliant. He's, you know, he's a British guy, so he has a British accent. I don't think he's even played any of the Americans. He's always a British actor, so, you know, he's got these little things where he says, in order to go, do you have to go, do or or some, something that's really difficult to understand. Basically, he's saying, in order to, Get out of his house. He has to. They have to go down to the basement, or whatever. Um, then there's also this point where he says he's like he's like high five. He he acts like this lonely guy. You never know if he has a wife or not. Did we go into that for obvious reasons? Um, let me get off of uh, this IMDb here and get into I guess a full screen. I. I thought that this movie deserves probably like a 3 out of 5. Because. I'm trying to figure out how to go in the full screen. It's not as good as Anora, but it's definitely not. It's definitely not bad. Like, it's definitely worth a watch on one of your A list, I'd say. If you're uh, an AMC A list member, AMC, AMC Theaters. But also, if you're not too sure, Discount Tuesdays, I'd say it's worth a, worth a shot. Or at least matinee. It's better than the most of the horror movies I've seen this year. Um, I don't think I've seen too many. Uh, and, and almost everything is better than Megalopolis. It's, you know, it's like Madam Web was released earlier this year. That was terrible. Then Megalopolis came out, and it's just kind of like in the middle, and that's the marking point. People say that. Movies haven't been great this year. But anyway. Uh, so yeah, I, I definitely recommend this movie. Uh, so that's my little mini review. And without further ado, we can go into hearing other people. I will start off with Dave. You. New horror movie from distributor A24, or as 90s Hugh Grant might say. Oh, well, there's a uh, new uh, movie coming out. It's quite, quite scary, quite scary. Um, and uh, you, you, you could, you could, you could, you could say it's, it is a, perhaps a, hor- horribly scary, and um, it stars uh, me.
This episode is brought to you by Chubbies. Go to chubbyshorts.com and use promo code DAN20 for 20% off your order. And stay tuned after the video for more info. Hello everybody, I'm Dan Merle, and this is my review of Heretic, which is the latest A24 horror film. This one comes from writer-directors Scott Beck and Brian Woods, who co-created A Quiet Place with John Krasinski, but whose last film as directors was the disappointing dinosaur action film 65, starring Adam Driver. Sophie Thatcher and Chloe East star as Sister Barnes and Sister Paxton, two Mormon missionaries who show up at the door of Mr. Reed, played by Hugh Grant, to spread the word about the LDS Church. While Mr. Reed seems to be an eager potential convert, it soon becomes clear that he has more sinister plans for the two girls as they're locked in the house and begin to sense that they're being tested and studied for reasons unknown. Heretic traffics heavily in a topic that many people might stay away from because it is very divisive, and that topic is religion. Hugh Grant's character questions the two girls not only about their religion, but about the faith of people worldwide. And you could see a world where this would be too divisive for what's wanting to be a mainstream movie. I know that feeling very well. It's so important to, to find your faith in a doctrine you actually believe. And that's a very, very personal struggle. That is a personal challenge that I've struggled with for a very, very long time. You know, what is the one true religion? <laughs> However, I would be surprised if a huge part of the audience was turned off by the film because I honestly think you could take somebody walking in that believes in God and somebody that doesn't believe in God and I think that they both might be able to walk out of the movie feeling like their position was well represented and that they were potentially validated by what happens in the movie. And I think that that's one of the great things about the screenplay. You take something like religion, which could easily go wrong if you're not careful about how you deal with it, could turn people off, and you write a screenplay that actually I think people from either side could find something to latch onto in. Heretic is mostly a three-person show, but the standout role is obviously Hugh Grant as Mr. Reed. I've been a big fan of his career choices for the last several years, including his comic turn in Paddington 2, his decision to play in Oompa Loompa, his villainous role in Dungeons and & Dragons, and even his performance as Thurl Ravenscroft in Unfrosted, which is a movie I did not care for. It's obvious that Hugh Grant at this point in his career is taking on roles that are challenging, that are perhaps more interesting to him, because he really was able to nail the whole persona behind being Hugh Grant back in the 90s and going into the early 2000s, and I like that he's sort of stretching his wings a little bit and saying, okay, you know, I could play this role, the same role over and over for the rest of my career, but I want to do something that's different and something that may surprise people. And I think that a lot of people who might know Hugh Grant mainly for romantic comedies are going to be very surprised by his performance in this film. Here he gets plenty of dialogue that drives the story as he pokes and prods the two missionaries and he's able to give it all an air of mystery, but at the same time he's often quite funny in a dark way as he expounds on board games and pop music and the fundamentals of world religion in order to conduct the tests that he has in store. It's a really good performance and it makes me even more excited for whatever the next choice he's gonna make because it really could be in any genre. And I mean, who would have thought that back in the 1990s that the foppishly handsome, stammering romantic lead would be able to credibly play a villain in a mystery thriller like this? I mean, it's pretty cool when you think about it, the arc of his career. If you are now regrettably ready to leave, uh, you'll have to exit through the back of my house. Well, can you just unlock the front one, please? We would like to go that way. Yeah, it, it won't open again till morning. It should be noted that Grant's performance wouldn't work nearly as well without Sophie Thatcher and Chloe East as his scene partners. East's sister Paxton is a Mormon since birth, fully immersed in church doctrine and desperate to succeed in her role of bringing new people into the church. Thatcher's sister Barnes is a converted Mormon who's been through her own life's journey that's left her less sure of her place in the church and the church's place in the world. And Mr. Reed picks up on those differences early on. Nearly every interaction in the film is a game of conversational poker as all three of them push and pull and try to see what the reaction of their opponent will be. 
I love a good talking movie if the talking is interesting. And I found the conversations in this movie to be very interesting, both on a screenplay level and because of how the scenes are played, the verbal, the nonverbal, the way that they're all trying to figure out what exactly is going on. I find that to be really well done. And I also think that this is a great example of a movie, you know, in horror movies when things happen and characters make certain decisions, a lot of times as an audience member, you're going like, oh, why would you do that? That's the dumbest thing in the world. The way this movie unfolds, there are decisions made by the characters that you actually understand in the moment because from the outside, they look like dumb decisions. But because this movie puts you so much into the reality of this situation, you understand why these characters are doing it because it seems like the only choice in the moment. And that's something that ties back to the core of the movie itself. There is a lot of mystery as Heretic unfolds. Is what we're seeing criminal? Is it supernatural? Is it theological? And given that this is an A24 film, I was bracing for some ambiguity, but the movie actually does provide us answers as it goes. This is a horror mystery as opposed to the more ambiguous or abstract approach that A24 often has taken in the past, but it also leaves a little bit of wiggle room. Again, I think people that are looking at it from a religious and a non-religious perspective will find some clues and hints there that could read to an interpretation either way. Heretic does hit a couple bumps in the road, but they're pretty small bumps. As with most mystery films or mysterious films, the destination to the journey can't quite match the interest and the intrigue of the journey itself. But I have to admit that I found myself engaged and curious throughout the movie, often worried about the fate of the main characters. And I feel like the arguments and discussions in the film felt real. They didn't feel like they were cooked up in a screenwriter's lab somewhere. This is a movie that could have felt very self-indulgent. I think that a lot of dialogue-heavy films run the risk of having the writer take the spotlight instead of the actors and the characters that we're supposed to be watching on screen. But I, I didn't really get that. I think that this is a pretty well-written film. And it's also a really good-looking film with cinematography from Chung Hoon Chung, who has an impressive resume, including the original Old Boy, Lady Vengeance, The First It, Last Night in Soho, and The Handmaiden, among others. Overall, I really enjoyed Heretic. If you're going to go back to my A24 horror rankings, which I just put out last week, and I would love it if you go watch that video, I would put it in that upper tier alongside movies like The Lighthouse and The Witch and Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. It may not be at the very top of the list, but it would be in that upper part. And I think it's one of their more mainstream films too. I was torn between what rating to give the movie on my personal scale, but I settled on a low grade see it now rating, if only because I think it features some genuinely good discussions and dialogue and is a pretty strong horror mystery thriller to boot. So that's a definite recommendation for me on Heretic. What do you think? Are you going to be heading out to the theater to see it this weekend? Let oh, me know down in the comments buddy. below. And before we go, I want to thank the sponsor for this video, Chubbies. Please. When I say Chubbies, you may think of Fun in the Sun and their awesome swimsuits. But Chubbies is also here for you in the fall with a full line of comfortable clothes that will have you feeling warm and looking great. Lately, I've been rocking their everywhere pant, which is great for lounging around the house, then heading out for a football game or to hang out with friends. And their carry-on flannel over shirt is perfect for nights this time of year when I need just a little something extra to stay warm. And if you've ever watched the channel or seen how I dress since, well, ever, you know that when it comes to plaid and flannel, I know what I'm talking about. And if you're still clinging to that last little bit of summer or you just have those weatherproof thighs, Chubby's always has their original stretch shorts, which you can pair with something warmer up top for the perfect fall look. If you're not wearing stuff from Chubby's, you're gonna wish that you were. And unless you're the Terminator, demanding that somebody who's wearing Chubby's clothes hand them over in the street probably isn't an option. So do yourself a favor and get a fall wardrobe upgrade that I know you'll be happy with. And would you look at that? For a limited time, our friends at Chubby's are giving fans of the show 20% off with the promo code DAN20 at checkout at chubbyshorts.com. That's 20% off your order with the promo code DAN20. And don't forget to support the show and tell them that Dan sent you. This fall, make the most of every moment with Chubby's. Shop now and fall into comfort, one stylish piece at a time. Thanks to Chubby's for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching. Be sure to stay tuned right here this weekend. I've got more reviews, including one for Anora, which is a big awards and Oscar contender, as well as a review for the first act of Arcane League of Legends Season 2, which I've been looking forward to for a while. So don't forget to come back for those and to come back next week for Charts with Dan, Movie News, Box Office, all the stuff that we do. Until next time, stay safe, and I'll see you then. Bye.
Shit. Okay, okay, damn. <clears throat> oh, well. You know, I was. Yeah. I was covering the, um. Actual. Oh, Thomas Stoker just did it. I was covering the actual. Kind of winning of Trump. You know, earlier this week. Hey everybody, today. Sorry, Control Shift T, please. I gotta get that in as a copy. Hugh Grant stars in a new horror movie from distributor A24. We're gonna go. This is. Well, Jimmy John's here, I guess. You know what? This kind of saved Jimmy. This saved Jimmy. Heretic. Okay, Doki. Then I'm. I, I really want to know what. To, I'm not gonna do that 23 right now. That's too far. Okay, I tell you what, we'll go with Miss Deep Focus Lens at first. Apologize, I should have had this prepared, but I didn't. So uh, I'm just gonna copy and paste these these <clears throat> what I call references into my page, and uh, we'll go from there. Try not to take up too much time of this. You know, editing takes time. It is time consuming. It is definitely a time consuming business. Editing, I'm doing that right now. But let's go into deep focus lens here. She she offers a very thorough analysis of films, and I can tell she doesn't just watch movies like that are superhero based or little kid movies. I guess you'd say she didn't. I don't think she saw Transformers one. I would suggest that to her, but she did. But she's more of a mature viewer, if you will. She watches things that are suspenseful or thought-provoking, and she always does this with her hand, oddly enough. Uh, anyway, uh, so let's go to our girl. Uh, I'm going to get a short mic. I'm going to get a short mic. Today I'm going to be reviewing Heretic. This was directed by Scott Beck and Brian Woods. This seems to be a, a showcase, I think, for Hugh Grant in the third act of his legendary career. It is a, a way to repackage a familiar persona that he's charmed audiences with in romantic comedies for, for ages. The stuttering, boyish, quick-witted personality that is very English in nature, and it seems he could never really rid himself of that. But it's always been quite clear to me that Hugh Grant has a cynicism and a, a depth of curiosity to him. Mm -hmm. And I always thought it would be interesting to see if he could tap more into that in his mm -hmm. acting. And uh, he gets the chance, obviously, with Heretic. This is uh, another art house horror A24 vehicle. It embodies the hereditary aesthetic, kind of that, that postmodern mm -hmm. architectural symbolism as a way to navigate maybe deeper questions in the film. That's just what's in fashion these days. It's very, you know, The Shining. But as I said, I was intrigued by this movie, not only because of Hugh Grant, but I also thought the premise was really great. You have these two Mormon young women, I think they're maybe 19 years old, 20, and they are going door to door to uh, spread their, uh, their faith, their religion, obviously. They end up knocking on the door of Hugh Grant's house, and in this case, he's playing a character named Mr. Reed. And of course, the ladies are won over by his, his, his kindness, his awkwardness, but we learn very quickly that Mr. Reed is not at all who he seems to be on the surface. And his house is something of a trap that he has set up. It's like a way that he lures in young, innocent people who are impressionable, and he uses them kind of in an experiment so that he can test their faith, maybe test the strength of their beliefs. There is something to that angle also that is, it's just really funny. It felt like, you know, like a psychotic college professor that maybe, maybe he got fired in like the early 90s or something. And so it's like he waits alone like a hermit like in his house, just waiting for kids to come by. So it's like he can finish his lectures. He can have his Norma Desmond moment on the stage. It's just, it's funny. This movie does feel, yes, like a, like a Hugh Grant TED talk. It's a way to kind of showcase his acting practice his intellect, his his mastery of, of the spoken word. I think for me, I was never fully bored by the film, but I was never on edge at the same time. It wasn't gripping in the way that I wanted it to be. I think this movie is concerned with conceptualization, aesthetic, and maybe um, genre conventions and how they can subvert them in a way that is, yes, very postmodern in style, but they do so at the expense of 
I think, a compelling thesis, where the tension can escalate with, with real verb, and very little of this movie crackled for me. It's not particularly scary. The aesthetic, yes, it is very A24, so there is like a beauty and an mm. attention to detail, but it does yeah, feel, mm. at this point, too generic for A24. Yeah. It kind of lacked imagination. And then ultimately, once we, we sink our teeth yeah, down yeah. into the, the heart of the movie, the meat and potatoes, I, it just feels like we're getting treated to basic theology 101 and not in a particularly fun way or clever way. And the thing is, I enjoy certain elements of the movie. It's like, I like these young women. I like the dialogue between them, particularly in the beginning of the movie. It's like they have distinct characters, and you want to root for them, see where their characters do end up going in this experiment. But unfortunately, the payoff here is so simplistic and so uninspired that I think the whole idea behind the intellect of this character completely falls falls apart at that point. His attempts at all these gotcha enlightenment moments where he's lecturing these young women, it's just flimsy because, again, nothing he is saying is particularly interesting. It's like anyone with half a brain at some point in their lives has entertained ideas like this. Maybe not with the, with the eloquence of Hugh Grant and with the fancy words, but, you know, they've done it. They've arrived at it. And once he's made all of his pseudo-intellectual points about religion and about the way that it is packaged through narrative, all of this, he then reveals his true reasoning behind this entire game, and it is so stupid. I'm not gonna give it away, but for somebody this intellectual or whatever to design an entire game in this fashion around something this idiotic, it's just like... I was laughing out loud at that point. And that kind of humor could have been fun, I think, if they had leaned more into it. Um, and also, I think if the movie had had better tension, it would have been more interesting, because you can see the ending of this movie, or at least the idea for this movie, coming a mile away. As I'm watching it, I'm thinking to myself, oh god, is this, is this going where I think it's going? It better not, because if it does, that would be so stupid. But show enough. Now, I do think it would have been funny if the movie had leaned more into the joke where it's, it's making fun of the Hugh Grant character. It's like where it's making fun of intellectuals and that sort of the academic. How they'll have all these fancy words, all these interesting concepts they want to talk about, but ultimately it's just talk and they arrive at nothing and do nothing with it. I don't know, so I think that would have been hilarious, but there's something to the humor in this movie that it just feels off and not in the way that they meant for it to be. It's just like... It's dark humor, obviously, but it always felt too obvious and a little bit out of place. I think it would have been more interesting, too, if the dialogue was less on the nose or, like, it disguised its intentions a little bit more because it would bring out more of a human side in the characters, particularly the, uh, the young girls. Because the point is that we're going to learn about them. It's like we're going to have revelations about who they are. It's like when they decide to challenge Mr. Reed at certain points. They no longer feel like characters. They feel like mouthpieces for the screenwriter, and I just... I don't buy into it quite. And I'm going to be honest, a lot of my problems with this movie ultimately stem from the performance of Hugh Grant. And I have to say, before I, I start there, I am a huge Hugh Grant fan. I like He's one of those actors who I have a soft spot in my heart for him because I, I kind of grew up on his movies as a child. But I was just really hoping that he would explore more sides of his talent and maybe more sides of his acting vulnerability here. I think it would have been more interesting if he did find some looseness within that character. He's clinging too hard to this cheerful, cheeky, awkward sort of uh, tactic. But what this performance revealed to me is I think he's, he's still a little bit too afraid to go to those darker places. His typical persona here, it, yeah, I think it was meant to be, like I said, a gateway drug into a, a darker place. But as the movie goes on, it starts to feel more like a distraction. It never bridges any gaps dramatically for the character, and so he doesn't feel like much of a character. Grant is often said that he, he loves dialogue and it's quite clear that's his wheelhouse and that he he doesn't like more the cinematic acting when I when I say cinematic acting I mean the acting with no words where maybe he has to do like a, a close-up or he has to react a reaction shot something of that nature he hates that and right there I think that's the problem with this role yes he is charming he's charismatic all those things but it's like Ultimately, when you look in his eyes and you look at the in-between when it comes to this character, it's like he's not revealing much dimension to the soul. If Grant does continue with these roles in the future, and I really hope he does, I hope that the next time he can shed those comfort levels even more, because I think he is totally capable of it. There was some sort of something brewing between this trio of people, a, a complexity that maybe is not on the surface, but you could feel the undercurrent of it, just in their chemistry. And I, I found myself really interested in that. And just Hugh Grant, you know, again, as a persona, it's like he's handsome, he's debonair and all that. But I have to say, there's something about him. I love him so much, but 
my uh, reaction to him as a woman has always been more platonic. And I think this movie uses that, at least on the surface, mm. to its advantage. It's like, you know, I think most girls would not go into a house if it was like some domineering, like masculine kind of guy. That would be intimidating. But when it's Hugh Grant, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, sure. So he starts to find this indirect pathway to that masculine dominance when it comes to women. And I don't know, I thought that was cool. Again, I just wanted a lot more of that to be shown in the character. Moments are always forming in the movie, and at times it's like you can see where these ideas could have been provocative if explored in the dialogue in an interesting way. But the movie becomes just so lazy when it gets to a certain point, and it just descends into the typical horror schlock that we're so used to. A bunch of cliches, but in particular, these are the A24 art house cliches. It does feel kind of, I don't want to be too mean, but it feels kind of like the A24 clearance item, the leftovers of all the symbolism within A24 movies. That is, yeah, a zapped of a little bit of imagination. But, you know, that's just my opinion. I think if you're listening to this review, you have a good sense of whether you're going to like this movie or not. For some people, I think they're going to like it. If you're an A24 fan, I think that this might be worth streaming, but I wouldn't go pay full price for this. But that is my review. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm going to plug my website as always. It is deepfocuslens.com. I'm an artist. I do commission portraits and I sell prints of my work. If that is something that you're interested in, you can always go to the website below. And if you have a question about a commission or a print, you can always email me. My email is in the description box below as well. Also, I'd like to give a shout out to my patrons who are great. Guys, thank you so much for your support. Welcome to all the new members. If you are interested in supporting, the link for that is below, as well as the rest of my social media information. You can watch more videos here, and you can subscribe if you'd like. Catch you next time. Keep talking. That's close enough. Oh, okay. Well, I celebrate the going. Oh my god, this is actually worth a shot. <clears throat> okie okay, dokie okay, then. Uh, let's see. Okay. <clears throat> that was deep. We spent some lens, not watch that. We'll save that for watch later. Uh, save to watch later. Sorry about that. Uh, there is a big war, is and this is the next. This. Well, this, this stuff is interesting too. Don't get me wrong, but it's not interesting for tonight's topic. Unfortunately. Okay. I'm gonna go into Jeremy Hill and then go into Thomas Thorgood because I can't decide. Hopefully, the scares like are not something that ended up on your phone because you didn't have today's sponsor of this video. This video is brought to you by NordVPN. NordVPN is the VPN service that continually stores. No, no, that's man. just that's great. Exactly, you don't. But curiosity gets the best website, a file you download. That suspicious email that didn't look suspicious Wait. at the time from great. Aunt Birgit clicked on the email, so here we go. But with Nord in your corner, is there to shut that down. Oink. Service has that show or movie you really love. You want a location with one click. Choose between over 5,000 service questions. Users can get a huge disc tea. I always appreciate Religion. <laughs> so heretics written in direct <laughs> less divisive than movies. Get that. And now oh, let's switch good. gears. Let's talk about a subject that's slightly less divisive than movies. Religion. So Heretics, written and directed by Scott Beck and Brian Woods, it's the story of a couple of sister missionaries from the Mormon church who stumble across this house. That's right. We've all seen Mormon missionaries out there on their bikes. Maybe they're walking with their backpacks. Maybe they've knocked at your door. And they're usually dudes 19 to 21 years old. Lesser known is the fact that there are, in fact, sister missionaries. Which has always been kind of weird to me. I've always been like, is that, is that safe? Maybe that's what the movie, maybe this is the movie going, no, it's not. But they come to this house where Mr. Reed, played by Hugh Grant, lives. And they start talking and he starts debating religion with them. Sounds kind of boring. It's actually weirdly not. In fact, for the first half of this movie, I was remarkably engaged. All it was was people talking. Tarantino's out there like, I know. 
You can make a career out of that. Not that this has the snappy, punchy Tarantino dialogue, no. But it was executed really well. These girls go into this house. This guy's obviously being a little sketchy. He's not being completely honest with them. And you know that. They feel that. Everyone should run from this house right now. But, you know... They don't. And now they're stuck in this house in which they're gonna have to do the most uncomfortable thing ever. Debate religion. Ugh. And that was where I was in the first half of this movie, in which this movie is a sequence of three rooms or so that they enter, in which Hugh Grant's character's like, all right, so religion. Here's some metaphors involving board games or music. At a point I was like, is this the movie? Did I accidentally stumble into a two hour lecture? A kind of. It's not necessarily the entire movie, the props to make his point do end up changing. Otherwise, yeah, pretty much. But again, giving props with how engaged I was while it was going down because the uncomfortable situation, the, the danger alarms going off in your head are always there. It's always on your mind that the door locks behind them and they just can't leave this house. No matter what the subject matter, the guy could have been like, so, how great is Animaniacs, really? I mean, you've seen it, right? And it would still be like, but they can't leave. This situation is uncomfortable and dangerous. Any subject matter it is kind of odd. It feels like two movies went splat. A movie about these girls who can't get out of this house. And a movie where this guy's like, so, religion. I do feel Hugh Grant was pretty perfectly cast in here. Because if we're all being honest, charming, likable 90s rom-com guy, Hugh Grant. And now he's older Hugh Grant, which makes him feel a little more seasoned. He's a charming, likable guy, which gets these girls in the door and you know you're just watching a couple of flies fly right into the spider's web. But it makes sense. He comes across as this probably was a likable guy at a time until he lost his mind on Facebook. And that's the problem I run into in this game when they're playing this intellectual game of checkers posing as chess. At a point I thought to myself, to what end am I watching this? Like, what's the point aside from being lectured? Then I walked out of the movie going, what was the point, aside from being lectured? There are some fun, cool, otherwise interesting points Hugh Grant's character brings up in the movie, but I promise you, you have seen them in a YouTube video or read them on social media before. There's no new information here. It's like a best of from that guy. You know the guy. Maybe he's a family member. Maybe he's a friend. Maybe he's a friend of a friend that you friended on Facebook, but we all know the guy. The guy on any given night might just feel it in which he sits down on his computer and goes, all right, Facebook. Here's my opinion on this hot button topic. And he just goes. No one really asked. The movie feels, actually, Hugh Grant's character kind of feels like he was probably that guy. I'm that guy. Kind of sort of. Hi. At a point, people stopped responding. He didn't get any more arguments. Realized that everyone had muted him. So he was like, I got a plan. I'm going to build this mousetrap monstrosity of a house and then when people come knocking at my door then they'll have to listen again i thought the parables and metaphors dude brought up were good but it starts feeling like copy and paste like the guy on facebook he just wants them to be like you're right we're wrong now can we go i thought the ones who played the two sister missionaries i thought they were good too played by sophie thatcher and chloe east the dynamic between the two was actually what i liked most you got one who was way more molly mormon about it born into the religion and you got the other who you feel like is still on her quest to find what she believes and that quest has just led her to being on a two-year mission for the Mormon church. That's what the girls should be named. The sister missionaries in this movie are named Fight and Flight. I do take away a couple marks from the script, though. Not just because, you know, the script is essentially written by Facebook posts about religion. No, the fact that no one in the movie said the real Mormon F-word. Fetch. That's right, that's fetching crazy. Substituting one F-word for the other, so you can kind of curse, but not really. Or was that just a guy thing in the 90s? I don't know. Point is, I heard no fetches brings the score down a bit. But judging the movie based as a thriller for tension, there were things in this movie that, I'm sorry, this didn't make sense. The movie's gonna have an unfolding, an unraveling of what's actually going on, reveals. And at a point I was like, nope, that just doesn't actually make sense. But in the end, I had a surprisingly enjoyable time with Heretic, probably because I didn't see the trailer. I knew nothing about it. The main stars of the movie being that overwhelming sensation of discomfort and tension. And Hugh Grant, I thought he was great. Kind of like Raul Julia in the mid 90s Street Fighter channeled that Gomez Adams energy. And it's odd to say, but when you watch it, it works. Hugh Grant channeled that likable, charming rom-com energy to deliver a character 
that makes you feel uncomfortable. But he wasn't necessarily sleazy. That's what I like about him. He still does come across as a gentleman. It's very conflicting, but in an interesting kind of way. I was like, all right, two girls in a house. At what point is this just going to be... At what point are they going to have that scene that doesn't need to be in here? It's not like that. I say if you've not yet become so annoyed with that guy on your Facebook to the point in which you mute him, and you're up for another two-hour lecture about the fallacies of religion, however, in a film that does have some solid tension, I had myself a surprisingly good time. No alcohol required. Subject of much amusement is what does this guy do when nobody knocks at his door? How often does he actually get missionaries, really? Like, what... What does he do in his spare time? Uh, Facebook posting. Right. I already answered that, I guess. All right, so Heretic, have you seen it? What did you think about it? Whatever you thought, comment below, let me know. And as always, if you like what you've seen here and you want to see more, click right here to see more. That's fetching crazy. Oh, okay, let's get back to the show. We've already seen Deep Focus Lens. <sighs> Movie files, ending explained. It's not a rem. So you just get. It's not going through. These are some of the things we're gonna watch. Next, let's watch Thomas Storgood. The brand new horror movie. In this video, we will be diving straight into its deeper themes and symbolism. Symbolism. There will be spoilers. Let us begin. Probably should save this for later. When I say horror movie, I doubt that the first thing to come into your head is a theological debate, and yet. That's what this film is. It's a discussion about the nature of faith told through the language of horror. And actually it makes perfect sense. And this is gonna hit home with him perfectly because Thomas Thorgood is a rather Christian, he's a Christian, so. As director Scott Derrickson has said. You know, I always talk about horrors being the genre of non-denial. It is an attempt to shock and to horrify and find within the horrible truth that is typically repressed or, or unexpressed or inexpressible. In other words, horror cinema has the potential to explore our deepest questions. Heretic begins in classic horror movie fashion. Two young ladies, Sister Barnes and Sister Paxton, embark on a journey to the outskirts of their town. Horror films often start like this. It represents the transition away from normal life and into the unknown. Here, at the fringe of society, anything can happen. These two characters are Mormon missionaries, and they have been sent to the house of Mr. Reed, apparently at his request. He has expressed interest in hearing more about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It begins to rain, or as we often say, the heavens open. It's a phrase that comes from the Bible, and this film is all about trying to peer into the heavens, trying to peel back the layers and get to the truth. They knock on the door, they see the form of Mr. Reed approaching through the narrow frosted window, and much of the film will be like this. Our characters will receive glimpses, they'll get part of the picture, but they'll need to figure out what's really going on. Mr. Reed opens the door and greets these weary travellers, apparently with a warm welcome. He's interested in talking about theology. His home is inviting. There's a blueberry pie in the works. What could be better? 
as the rain lashes down on these two ladies standing on his doorstep, he makes a jokey reference to Noah's flood, the biblical event in which the springs of the great deep burst forth and the floodgates of the heavens were opened. The waters of judgment swirled on the earth and the only refuge was aboard Noah's ark. The implication is simple. He's saying to these ladies, come aboard my ark, find refuge from the storm. His hospitality is almost irresistible, but this man is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Once this pair are inside the house, all contact to the outside world is severed. He has them in captivity. And now, the only way out is through. The only way out is through. His theological tirade against them proceeds in stages. First, he attacks the specific claims of Mormonism. Stop me when I go wrong. He was visited in the night by an angel called Moroni. Moroni. Moroni, <laughs> who showed him where he could locate some golden plates near his home. His mysterious translation of those plates form the basis of this. <laughs> wow! Highlighting its uncomfortable relationship with polygamy, Joseph Smith, its founder, appeared to endorse the practice by having many wives in the early 1800s. But in 1890, the LDS Church stated in a manifesto that polygamy is wrong. Mr. Reed's point is simple. The LDS Church adjusted its teaching to make its message more palatable to contemporary culture. He claims that most religions are like this plagiarizing each other and repackaging themselves in order to gain converts. In his words, missionaries are just salespeople. We are negotiating a transaction of ideologies. Mr. Reed then gives a potted history of global mythology. He claims that all sorts of cultures have believed in saviour figures who were miraculously born and resurrected, and therefore there's nothing especially unique about the figure of Jesus Christ. He's just a repackaging of a story which has been told time and time again. That's his claim. Mr. Reed's monologue is a powerful piece of rhetoric, although it's worth noting that many of his claims about the similarities between Jesus and the Egyptian gods have actually been debunked. There's no reference in Egyptian mythology to Horus being crucified or resurrected three days later. Horus, his mother, was not a virgin woman, but the goddess Isis, and there is no specific date anywhere tied to the birth of Horus. All of these claims and many others indicating that early Christians yoinked the mythology of Horus and stuck it on top of Jesus were all completely made up by Gerald Massey, a 19th century cuckoo banana bird self-taught Egyptologist who never provided the slightest shred of evidence for any of these claims. And even if there are similarities, that doesn't automatically discredit Jesus. But the premise of what Mr. Reed is doing here is very reminiscent of Joseph Campbell's 1949 book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. It was a groundbreaking work of comparative mythology, and Campbell examined all sorts of stories from around the world and down through history, and he noticed a recurring pattern, the hero's journey, or monomyth, which he summarizes as follows. A hero ventures forth from the world of common day into a region of supernatural wonder. Fabulous forces are there encountered and a decisive victory is won. The hero comes back from this mysterious adventure with the power to bestow boons on his fellow man. We keep telling that story. Different cultures will add their own dressing to it, but the shape of the story persists. The hero who ventures into the unknown to gain the victory. Humans keep telling those sorts of stories. It's a fascinating observation. But what does it mean? Mr. Reed interprets it as follows. He says, The holy texts we revere are mythologies which have been iterated. Not literally true, but a conduit to a more ancient truth. In other words, there is a deeper meaning to this world, he reckons. Our mythologies and religions are reflecting something of that deeper meaning but they are distortions. Somehow we need to look past them and get back to the original uncorrupted truth. This is compelling storytelling. We have no idea where it's going to go in this movie, and it certainly rattles our two central characters, along with the fact that they appear to be trapped in this man's house. He forces them to choose between two doors, belief and unbelief. Either there is a deeper meaning to life, there is something beyond, or there isn't. 
the universe is simply a collection of molecules clacking together. Which door will they choose? They choose the belief door, and then things get really disturbing as they go down into the cellar. A crucial symbol in the film is the butterfly, and the butterfly's life cycle proclaims resurrection. Think about it, a caterpillar forms a cocoon, its old body dies, and what emerges is this amazing winged creature. So it's often been taken as a symbol of resurrection. Now at the start of the film, in the living room, Sister Paxton reveals that she really likes butterflies. She says that when she dies, she wants to come back as a butterfly and follow the people that she loves. I don't know how that sits alongside her Mormon theology. It sounds a lot like reincarnation to me. But anyway, it's a semi-serious comment. And sure enough, there's an actual butterfly in the living room. It's clinging to a small six-sided window. Now, six is a significant number. In the last book of the Bible, Revelation, we read this. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast for it is the number of a man, that number is 666. If seven represents completion or perfection in the Bible, six falls short of that. And here the text is describing a kind of unholy trinity formed by Satan, the beast of the sea, and the beast of the earth, and their number is 666, a threefold falling short of the perfection of God, associated with the failure of Adam who fell in the Garden of Eden. He was created on the sixth day. Okay, so, we're not quite falling yet. The butt hasn't cut the snow. Yes. So she's falling down on one thing, and the other one she's already down, like her shoulders are touching the rock. So that's a striking image, a butterfly being restrained by a hexagonal window. And I think it represents the story in miniature form. The two sisters are like this butterfly, and the hexagonal window represents the captivity in po We have no idea where it's going to go the collect like they go down. It so it's often Sister Paxton reveals that she written Theolius comment to a small in the last book in sight, calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of... And here the text is describing a kind of unholy trinity formed by Satan, the beast of the sea, and the beast of the earth, and their number is 666, a threefold falling short of the perfection of God, associated with the failure of Adam who fell in the Garden of Eden. He was created on the sixth day. So that's a striking image, a butterfly being restrained by a hexagonal window. So that's a straw in the Garden of Eden of the perfection of God of the earth, and their number is 666, a three, the beast of the sea, and the beast of a kind of unholy trinity formed by Satan, the beast of the sea, and the beast of the earth, and their number is 666, a kind of like the trinity of, you know, of God, you know, God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit threefold falling short of the perfection of God, associated with the failure of Adam who fell in the Garden of Eden. He was created on the sixth day. So that's a striking image, a butterfly being restrained by a hexagonal window. And I think it represents the story in miniature form. The two sisters are like this butterfly, and the hexagonal window represents the captivity imposed by Mr. Reed, this beastly oppressor. His understanding of humanity is all about control, as we will see. As things escalate, and Sister Barnes gets her throat slit, apparently bleeding to death, there's another mention of the but butterfly. Mr. Reed brings up the story of the butterfly dream written by an ancient Chinese Taoist philosopher. Let's check it out. Once upon a time I dreamt I was a butterfly, fluttering hither and thither. To all intents and purposes a butterfly. I was conscious only of my happiness as a butterfly, unaware that I was myself. Soon I awaked, and there I was, veritably myself again. Now I do not know whether I was then a man dreaming I was a butterfly, or whether I am now a butterfly, dreaming I am a man.
In other words, if I am seemingly passing between the realm of reality and the realm of dreams whenever I go to sleep, how can I be sure which is which? It's thought-provoking, isn't it? I guess I trust that right now I'm in reality and not a dream because this feels more grounded and physical. Dreams seem to have a different quality to reality. Mr. Reed modernises it by bringing up the simulation hypothesis. Are we living in a simulation? And if so, when we die, do we leave that simulation? How would we know? There's a woman in the room who is supposedly a prophet of God. She poisons herself and appears to come back to life. Has she glimpsed what's on the other side of the curtain? Was it a near-death experience? Was it a hallucination? Well, it turns out it was a trick. The bodies were swapped. And these are all questions that Sister Paxton is forced to consider, along with us, the audience. It really keeps up the suspense. But ultimately, all this is leading Sister Paxton to one place, what Mr. Reed describes as the one true religion. He claims to have discovered it. Control. He tells Sister Paxton that her religion, Mormonism, has been controlling her this whole time. He was able to predict her every move based on what her mentors had handed down to her. He says this, you have allowed them to dictate every decision of your life. And Mr. Reed's assertion is that control is what lies behind every religion. The desire to control others, that's what's ultimate. It's a bleak view of reality. And Mr. Reed has embraced it. Beneath his house, his female prophets are caged to do his bidding. After this climactic confrontation, Sister Paxton tries to escape, and her own faith appears to dwindle. As a bleeding Mr. Reed crawls towards her, she says this, I think it's beautiful that we all pray for each other, even though we know it probably doesn't make a difference. Now, it would be easy to see this film as atheistic propaganda, a slam-dunk argument against the religions of the world, saying they're all about control. But I think that's too simplistic a reading of the film, because if the makers of the film simply wanted to have a theological debate, they would have had a theological debate. Instead, they told a story. According to Mr. Reed, control is what's ultimate. But does the film itself agree with that? Well, this is where it gets really interesting. Mr. Reed is the villain. The film ends with him being defeated. And how does that happen? It happens at the hands of Sister Barnes, who we thought was dead. At the lowest point in the story, she arrives unexpectedly to expend herself out of love for her friend, defeating the enemy and setting the captive free. It's an act of self-sacrifice. And it's ironically reminiscent of the crucifixion, the very event that Mr. Reed was so determined to lump in with every other religion and mythology. Look at the imagery that's used here, the plank of wood with the nails, the bloodied nails. So what is ultimate in this film? What has the last say in this film? It's not control, as Mr. Reed would expect. In fact, it's not verbalised, it's shown, it's demonstrated. It is this self-sacrificial salvation, setting the captive free. Mr. Reed was bringing one kind of message, but the film around him is saying something different, it seems. Sister Paxton stumbles out into what is now a snowy wonderland. In the Bible, snow often represents purity. This scene is rather reminiscent of Lucy stepping out of the wardrobe into Narnia. The sun is rising, chasing away the darkness of the night before. A butterfly lands on Sister Paxton's hand. The camera angle changes and the butterfly is gone. Did it fly off? Did she imagine it? I think this ending shows that the questions of the film are still open. Maybe despite everything that Mr. Reed taught, there is more to this universe than control. Many people like Mr. Reed view Christianity as just another religion of control. And we've certainly tried to turn it into that. Mormonism is one such example. If you keep the commandments, you'll get a good place in paradise. But I find traditional Christianity compelling precisely because it's the one religion I've found that isn't about control. It's not about us giving our lives to God. It's about God giving his life for us. I don't know what you make of that. But I think we can reject Mr. Reed's assertion that Christianity contains nothing unique. I guess I look at that figure, nailed to a piece of wood, descending to the deepest depths of agony and self-sacrificial love, and I think, if there is a deeper meaning to the universe, it's him. And I can't imagine denying that to my dying day, even if I end up believing it's not true. 
I can't imagine a more compelling figure. So, Heretic. I was blown away by this movie. From the way it started, I thought it was going to be a dogmatic lecture directed against religious belief. But no, the character of Mr. Reed is doing that, but in the context of a film which is itself wrestling with those questions. And I don't think it claims to arrive at the answers. It leaves the questions open. And any film that starts those conversations about the biggest questions of life, I think that's a welcome addition to our cinema screens. So let me know what you think. Hello, Thomas here. You might enjoy a short film I directed called The Telltale Heart. It's based on the Edgar Allan Poe short story of the same name, and we had a lot of fun with it. Loads of practical effects and unhinged performances. And you can watch it by clicking here. I'd love to hear your thoughts. On this channel, I try to look at film from a different perspective, and sometimes I have a go at making films myself. Thank you so much for watching. Do subscribe if you'd like to stay in the loop, and I will be back soon. Goodbye. <laughs> anyway, so <clears throat> I want to I want to keep reading about sorry about my little talking mess. I want to keep reading about these uh <clears throat> you know things and explain maybe get some new faces in <clears throat> and get some uh like some exp explanations as to you know the ending explain and whatnot and. <clears throat> some are going to contain spoilers, some are not. I'm Heretic, which is... Sorry. Try to organize them a little bit. So yesterday I... Try to organize them just a bad bit. Uh, okay, so it does... Make sure they don't play, you know, make, uh, too fast. <clears throat> so I'm going to... Probably should organize this into like spoilers and non-spoilers. Uh, which is kind of...